I'm Dr. Adam Pritchard. And I'm Dr. Matthew Bortz. And this is Pastime. So you became Dr. Matthew Bortz like an hour and a half ago. As of this recording, I have the and signatures that say yeah. I am I am Matthew Bortz, comma, PhD. That's amazing. And I got the signatures just what month is this? <laughs> what, what month is this? <laughs> I think it's November. It's November. So I got the signatures just a few months ago myself during the summer. So now pastime has gone full PhD. And that feels great because it's been a long time coming. We've been, how do you, we've been, how do you, we've been feel, trucking. How do you feel right now? I feel like I did before this. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. That's true. You really... I feel like over the last couple of years of my life, I devoted hours and hours to answering one very big question. And I finally got to share it with a lot of people to show what I'd learned. People who know nothing about it in large part. But... It's new for them that yeah, they learned all of this. It's new for me. But for me, I've known this stuff for weeks and finally got to show it to enough people that they agreed I get to be a doctor because I know enough stuff. Because you know enough <laughs> stuff. But the question is, why did I do that? That's a why? fair question. <laughs> why do we get – why do we have doctors in science? Why is that an important thing? And – there are a lot of ways to be a paleontologist without being a doctor. Uh, we know many colleagues who work on fossils mm-hmm. who That's know true. as much more than we do about some groups of animals that never went to school long enough to become PhDs. Or didn't learn the same set of skills that we do. The fossil preparators who work in labs and clean up materials and do all kinds of fine detail work that I personally would be just horrible horrible at so one of the things that i think we wanted to share as part of our experience getting our phds is to talk about what is this process what motivated us Mm -hmm. to go into programs that would end up giving us these letters after our names right and this all begins with this thing called graduate school which is school that happens after you go and get your undergraduate degree and After then you, you keep think going. You're to done school. with school. <laughs> yeah, everyone you celebrates keep going to school. All my friends celebrated the last exam that they would ever take. Good for them. We knew it Good wouldn't be them. true. Neurobiology, May of 2009. That was it for me. What was the last class I took? You, you probably won't remember. I don't. <laughs> but that's just and, it. It doesn't matter. It's so long ago. And so my undergraduate degree was in anthropology. And in geology. And mine was in just biology. And those were fundamental to building the kinds of questions I wanted to ask about the fossil record. Mm-hmm. Well, but, you needed the background in all of those subjects to really get a good sense of how to address those questions. And figuring out how to address questions, even seeing what those questions are, is part of what motivates the decision to go to graduate school. Yeah, that's true. There are paleontologists, I believe a paleontologist is anyone who has an interest and fascination and an expertise in the fossil record. What we have become by going to graduate school is research paleontologists. Mm -hmm. We are able to contribute original research, things that people didn't know about the fossil record, to our understanding of the fossil record. We've learned the skills that let us do that. And where you learn those skills, usually, is within graduate school which is a little different from undergrad because it kind of gives you more flexibility to explore different ways of answering and posing questions. So there are these two levels of graduate school. There's first the master's level, people who will go in and do their master's for graduate school. A master's degree is like a first taste at doing an intensive research project. With a master's, you get schooled in a very large research question, but then you take a small component of that question and do a project on that. And usually a master's is something that lasts for two, maybe three years. Yes. Going into a doctorate program, 
is committing to asking a question that takes a much longer period of time to try to answer. Right. It's a half decade or up to seven, eight years. It can take a long, long time. So it took us about six years. Adam it's did it faster than I did. Not very much faster. <laughs> I did it in summer. Um, but it's something that you you commit to when you know. You know this is what you want to do forever. What it means to go through a doctorate program is that you have identified a question that will take that much time to answer. Because there are lots of pieces to answering the question. So you take a large question. So what was the big question that led to your doctorate? Well, what I wanted to know is there were a lot of strange and mysterious reptiles from the Permian and the Triassic period almost 250 million years ago that no one knew exactly how they were related. But people had this sense that they were close relatives of the common ancestor of all living reptiles. So the common ancestor of turtles, crocodiles, birds, lizards. So it's this amazing and really important time in evolution. But we had all these mysteries about how the animals around that time were related. So what I did is I looked at a number of fossil specimens that were critical to looking at that question. I redescribed them. I looked at them using CT scans. I built 3D models of them. And I used those, that new information plus data I gathered from visiting museums all over the world, as you know, you were traveling with me for part of that, to build a new tree of relationships, to understand the timing of this reptile evolution, how all these groups fit together, what the major evolutionary anatomical changes that were going on there. It was a lot of different little components that added up to answering a big question. And, and what about you? Mine was looking at this early evolution and the extinction, ultimately, of a group of carnivorous mammals that filled in the meat-eating niche that we see in Africa for the first two-thirds of the age of mammals. So we, just we, after the dinosaurs go Exactly. Out. Dinosaurs go out about 66 million years ago. And in Africa, this group of animals called hyenodonts are the only meat-eaters we find in the African record until 23 million years ago. That's the end of the Oligocene. It's so like two-thirds of the age of mammals has gone by when carnivorans, the group that today includes dogs and cats and bears, those are most of the meat eaters we have walking around on the planet, they finally become part of the African ecosystem. So what motivated my question was looking at how these animals in Africa were related to one another because there was evidence of these things also living in North America, they lived in Europe, they lived in Asia, and Figuring out how they shunted from one continent to the next was this massive question that required visiting museums all over the world and describing material, especially from this site in Egypt uh, that I work on called the Fayum Depression. And the Fayum is kind of our best window into the early evolution of African mammals. And in the Fayum, there were all of these specimens of hyenodonts that had never been described. And so that means other paleontologists weren't able to look at them very easily. So I was able to go in and kind of show other paleontologists, here's what I found, here's what their teeth look like, here's what their skulls look like. Now let's all work together to try to figure out how they're all related to one another. One thing that's hilarious about our dissertations is they're actually really weirdly similar because we both took obscure, strange animals that most people just slap a question mark on when they find them in the middle of the, the desert field and just ignore. And we put them in bigger contexts of how ecosystems changed, in my case during the Triassic period, in your case in the Cenozoic era. In order to answer those questions, they are big scaled questions. And it's hard for someone who has a lot of other stuff going on in their lives. If they're a professor, they have lots of meetings, they're teaching students, they're advising students, there's a lot to preoccupy them. A master's student, doesn't have the time in those two to three years of doing a master's project to really take this big research question and figure it out. So that's part of the reason why doctoral researchers are valuable. So it's someone who says, you know what, I'm going to take five years of my life to try to answer this massive question that hopefully can be built upon in a really dramatic way by future researchers. And one of the things that takes many years about it is you have to attack it from multiple angles. You have to go at it, in your case, you have to dig up new animals or take the material of newly dug up animals 
and describe it and photograph it, put it in a big detailed context, and you have to look at it, look at material from museums all over the world from previously described animals, and you have to put it in a big analytical context using a bunch of different computer algorithms to rebuild the trees and to understand how this these continental changes happen. It's all about taking that big question and approaching it not from one angle, but from every angle you possibly can to get the just a whole understanding. And for what you were able to do, you kind of built upon those methods and also used a lot of the scan data from fossils that were mm-hmm. very hard to actually research because they're so small and so delicate. And you spent hours and hours kind mm-hmm. of taking them out of the rock digitally and figuring out what bones went with what bones that we see in modern animals like lizards and crocodiles and finding out that there were some really weird early reptiles that rearranged their skeletons in ways that we had no idea they did until you did this work. Yes, stay tuned for that. <laughs> and in doing that, you were able to take this time to show you can ask a big question. And lots of people who are interested in science can ask big questions. But part of what happens in the course of graduate school is you learn how to take a big question and break it down into these small parts and then answer smaller questions that help you build an answer for your big one. And a master's, you can only ask a few of those questions because you have a shorter period of time. And a PhD, you can ask many different component questions that build into an even larger story. And ultimately what that means is going forward with our doctorate degrees, we can say, I've, I have done this before. I have asked a big question. And not only do I ask the question, I know how to break it down and answer it. And that's really important for kind of going forward in paleontological research. Um, and so a lot of... A lot of paleontologists who lead research projects have a doctorate degree because they have demonstrated to groups that might be interested in funding paleontological research or universities that might want to have a paleontologist on staff that they can say, here's a person who asks big questions and breaks them down into small pieces. Those small pieces can be given to other students. Those small pieces can be given to other researchers associated with the lab. There's maybe high school students. Those may be undergraduate researchers. Those may be master's students. And sometimes really big questions will be given to another graduate student. And you then, with your PhD, can offer some advice to someone else who's trying to break down another question. And a big part of our doctorate experience, I think, was identifying who could be our mentors, who could help us generate the big questions and then answer them by breaking them down. Uh, you know, one thing I want to talk about right now is just the process of picking the programs we wanted to end up in. Because you and I, when we left our undergraduate programs, had decided, in essence, that this is what we wanted to do with the rest of our lives. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and so what we were looking for was we already understood a little bit, not much, especially not in my case, but a little bit of the big questions we wanted to talk about. I wanted to understand the interrelationships of reptiles. I thought I wanted to look at dinosaurs. It turned out, eh, you know, heck with dinosaurs for now. And you thought you wanted to work on mammals from the age of dinosaurs. Well, I knew that I wanted to work on mammals, and I wanted to work on mammal evolution in Africa. Mm, okay. And one of the things I identified as I emerged from my undergraduate degree, where I had been introduced to these questions about how interesting the African record was and how interesting mammal evolution was, is I was able to identify other researchers who were already working yes. who also worked on Africa and also worked on mammal evolution questions. And we kind of get into this rating question when we talk about... Mm, yeah universities like when you're applying to undergrad you might be very familiar with these u.s news and world reports for the united states where different universities are kind of ranked for how successful students are as they emerge from programs what kinds of degrees they get one of the things that makes it kind of hard to do the search for graduate school is for a field like paleontology which has a real which for a field like paleontology where there aren't a whole lot of people that ask paleontological questions It's not like there is a large department in any one place that the U.S. World News Report is aware of to say, you know what, the best paleontology program is this one. Instead, part of Mm -hmm. the 
process of finding a graduate school mentor who's going to help guide your research question is finding someone who's interested in the kind of questions that you are interested in. That's right. They might be at a school that isn't very highly rated. For, in the traditional sense. Yeah, for other fields. But there aren't many research groups that are looking at paleontology. You could end up at the most well-funded, like beautiful campus, like this legendary school. But if there's no one there who wanted to study African mammal evolution or knew anything about African mammal evolution, because each paleontologist has their own sphere of knowledge, they don't know everything, you wouldn't have been happy. You wouldn't have been able to do what you wanted to do. And so for both of us, we were able to identify different researchers at Stony Brook yes. University who both worked on questions that we were interested in. So in my case, I worked with Dr. Eric Seifert at Stony Brook, who has been part of a long field project working on these early African mammal evolution questions. So he was a great person to then help me figure out my own questions and break them down to smaller pieces. And he's really grown an amazing beard in the last five years. Really has. It's amazing. The Darwin is strong yeah, with this one. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I worked with Dr. Alan Turner, who primarily focuses on the evolution of both crocodiles and their fossil relatives in the Mesozoic era, and theropod dinosaurs, specifically the animals closest to the origin of birds, which include a lot of the classic raptor dinosaurs. And when I came in, I thought I wanted to work on dinosaurs, but Alan kind of directed me into other groups of reptiles that are not as sort of saturated with people trying to understand them at this point. Lots of mysterious groups. And that's what brought me into the Triassic period, when kind of a whole bunch of reptile evolution was going on, and there were lots of outstanding questions about, well, who are these reptiles? What do they look like? How are they related? And our experience in identifying a potential research advisor is something that's true for many different kinds of research scientists, not just for research paleontologists, where you almost have to demonstrate that you're interested in research by doing research on the people doing the research. Yeah, no, that's fair. You would need to understand a little bit about the scientific literature, the publications, because if you look at those and you're like, oh, I really enjoyed this publication on, you know, body size evolution in mammals during the Mesozoic era. Who wrote Who wrote that is a really important question because then you can email the person, get in touch with them and say, are you still researching this? Are you interested in having people help you research this? Can I help you research this? This is These are important questions. You know what I want to, I want to say one thing? Asking questions of people is like is not only important for taking the first steps towards graduate school and asking people, are you taking students? Are you interested in having someone help you look at this question? But also asking questions and asking for knowledge and specimens and access is one of the most important skills you learn during the whole of graduate school. And you're, if you are interested in becoming a research paleontologist, as someone listening to this, one of the important things that you need to do is to reach out to researchers that are interested in what you're interested in. Let them know that you really want to help contribute to this mm -hmm. body of knowledge. You won't necessarily be selected, even if you're really enthusiastic in a geology course that you're taking. There are lots of people who are very interested and happy to kind of ask the questions and then learn the answers from other people. And for me, there are lots of scientific disciplines that I love paying attention to. Oh, yeah. I love psychological research. I also love history. And I love yeah, I read, I read a lot that. about archaeology. I read a lot about, like, discoveries in astronomy. I'm never going to ask a scientific question about Pluto and answer it myself. Yeah. It's just not what I want to do with my life. And so it's important that you identify yourself as someone that wants to contribute to that research. And in going forward, always being ready to kind of come forward and say, here's what I'm working on. Here's what you work on. Let's find a way mm -hmm. to collaborate. Collaborate. That's the, that's the, like the, the buzzword. Yeah, collaboration is, it's, it's not only a buzzword in science. It's, it's the essence of good science is being able to identify, you know, you know, I have a question and I have a set of things I know, but if I want to learn something more, it's not always enough to just read about the thing you want to learn about or you know, experiment with it in a, on a computer program or in a laboratory. You need to reach out to someone who already has that knowledge, who already has you know, that, those technologies, and work together with them. I had a thought. That's apparently all we're going to say. Yeah. He's, 
He's quiet. It's okay, though. I mean, he's, he, he needs to be quiet right now. Yes. Um, we're wearing sweaters, by the way, because it's yes. very academic. Because we're... You we can't see PhD. That. Yeah, no, it's... There's, there's actually a very regimented garb that you have to wear when you get a degree. All of that said, and when you identify someone whose research closely aligns with your interests... Okay. You're not locked in to that one thing in many oh, cases. No. There are some heck programs... No. And some scientific disciplines where you go into a lab and you are kind of channeled into a research question. Right. By going there, you know basically what you're going to do. But in other cases, and in many cases of, of other mm-hmm. researchers we've known, there's some flexibility within that. You don't have oh, to say, totally here's flexible. a question I want to answer. I'm going to go forward and just do that. Because mm-hmm. once you get into graduate school, you're exposed to other people doing other right. kinds of research. You're exposed to other methods. It's not just using what you learned in undergrad and then applying that mm-hmm. to big questions. Well, there's, that's collaboration again. Yeah. This is being able to extend yourself. And you know, we've talked about our dissertation projects, but both Matt and I have done different projects that involve other groups of animals. I worked a lot on crocodile relatives during the Jurassic period. Matt has worked on limb evolution and anatomy and how that relates to the, the role in the ecosystem of some mammals. Like, so you're not directly linked to our main dissertation projects. But there are other things we can do. And that's another thing in scientific research is being able to expand yourself beyond a central question into sub-questions and new questions. And moving in the opposite direction, something that's important about identifying finally that question you want to ask and the way that you're going to answer it is for many people, we come into this because we're interested in Big evolutionary questions, big scientific questions. Where did reptiles come from? And it can be really unsatisfying to have to pick and narrow down that question you start off to something that you can manage to pull off in five to six years. What is the tree of relationships here? So figuring out what it is that's going to be your narrow area of interest can be difficult because you're wrestling with wanting to be this interesting person with big questions, but ultimately... By narrowing yourself, you become an expert in that little area, and you demonstrate you can answer questions in that narrow world. Mm -hmm. You can then blow up those questions again. That's part of why we get our PhDs, is because now that we've answered very specific questions about early Triassic reptiles Mm -hmm. and meat-eating animals that are extinct, now we've demonstrated big questions, we answered them, now let's ask the other big questions related to what we think is interesting about the evolving world. And we go forward answering those, kind of having demonstrated we did it once over five years, give us another five years, see all the cool stuff that we can work on with other people. So one of the things that happens as we go into graduate school is we do take more classes. Like, what was your kind of timeline for oh, doing golly. your dissertation, it your doctoral dissertation? Pretty much exactly. It was exactly, well, you know, it was exactly like yours. <laughs> um, well, we came into graduate school, and for the first two years we did a little bit of scientific research on the side but it's very much a side thing here at stony brook because for the first two years you do take courses again and it's an intensive course load and at the end of those two years you take what are called qualifying exams in some programs these are exams that relate directly to your chosen dissertation topic at stony brook it's a little more diffuse than that you basically take an oral exam where you stand up in front of three professors and they shoot you with the hardest questions they can think of, the most detailed questions they can think of about the courses you've been taking for the last two years. Because they want to figure out if you you learned what they think you needed to know. And different programs approach this in different ways, but really what everyone is trying to test is you came from undergrad with Mm -hmm. big questions. You've taken a couple years and a couple classes learning more, building upon what you did for your bachelor's degree. Do you know that well enough to know what's in your toolkit to go forward with the research that we're going to let you do for the next couple of years? Are you ready to answer those research questions is their question. And so after you get through your qualification exams, sometimes those are in this kind of format where you're being asked directly by people. Sometimes they're written, sometimes a combination of those. Then you have to figure out exactly how we're going to ask and answer your question. That's essentially the next year here at Stony Brook. And so we both proposed our dissertation research after another year of doing work saying, here is what I'm interested in. My case meat-eating mammals, in your case, early reptiles. And so then we met with a group of researchers 
pulled from, then we met with a group of professors here at Stony Brook who were qualified to evaluate if we could actually answer that question given the smaller pieces we were going to do for the next couple of right. years. Usually each one of those brings in a special set of expertise. In my case, my advisor, Alan Turner, knew a lot about how to build trees of relationships. But he doesn't know a lot about the earliest reptiles during that Triassic period, because many of them resembled lizards. For that reason, I had some extra lizard experts who were part of my dissertation committee that came in. And so this research, this committee going forward now becomes your sounding board. Yep. As you start to produce research, you report back to the committee and say, here's my big question. Here's the part that I'm working on now to try to answer that big question. And here's my timeline for eventually answering my question a couple of years from now. And these things never change at all. And they're always exactly perfect. And by that, it's a, well, that's a complete lie because you're constantly telling your committee, well, it turns out this isn't, this didn't work. Like, I wasn't able to answer this question using this special method, or I can't get these fossils, or the, the CT data is just terrible or too expensive. And there's, research is like everything else in life. There's always a hiccup. There's always a new hurdle to get over. And part of the whole process of working on this dissertation is recognizing that all research requires some amount of adaptability as you go forward. Definitely. And for both of us... What we proposed a couple of years ago is <laughs> is different than what we yeah. ultimately did, and it's because there were all of these other pieces. There were pla there were fossils that ended up not being able to be part of our analyses. Mm -hmm. yep. There were kind of big questions we wanted to ask that our data wasn't sufficient to answer yet. Or the tools weren't there that we thought were available when we started. And so ultimately, the dissertation that we propose is our best shot over the mm -hmm. course of several years trying to address those questions. And our committee is responsible for saying, did you answer enough of this question to show that you can keep asking questions and continue answering them? I've told young graduate students, oh God, now I sound so old. You are. I've told new graduate students a couple of times now that when you are, you know you are ready to defend and complete your dissertation, once you realize how much more there is to do to really fully answer the question because with me i see i learned about all these new reptile animals all these new reptiles all these gaps in the fossil record all of these new tools i can use to analyze those animals while i was completing while i was finishing my specific dissertation projects and i'm i'm just this is going to take a career to really fully address these. And I know you, you had the same experience. Well, and that's part of the process is recognizing that you have become an expert on this yeah. narrow field. And in some ways, you become more qualified than your committee to evaluate your progress. Specifically on that project? Yeah, totally. Be because the idea is that we each become useful to other people who want to ask Definitely. questions. You want to become part of this research team going forward where someone finds some early reptiles, someone finds some early carnivores, they're working in the African record, they can say, hey, Matt, you know this area mm -hmm. really well. That's I know right. this area of the, what the Turkish record looks like. Let's compare those two to each other. And but we, when our powers combine, oh, then we can God, no. scale up really big, interesting questions. But it's important that you become an expert in an area so that you're useful to a team, that you're not just kind of waiting for other people to tell you what to do. Yeah. So, so functionally, yeah. you proposed, your committee said great. Mm -hmm. As the end of the third year of graduate school. So what happened next? I visited museums and wrote scientific papers and built this complicated data matrix where I charted the anatomy of all of these different Triassic reptiles. And I visited more museums and more museums and more museums. And I originally thought it was going to take two more years after my proposal, so a total of five years of graduate school. That didn't happen because I had a lot more work that I needed to do. I needed to apply for some more grants to get more funding to visit museums and other places in the world. And it turned out at the end of my sixth year, actually, that this summer was the end of my sixth year, was the time I had completed enough work to address the questions in a sufficient way to satisfy the needs of my committee and to graduate from Stony Brook with a PhD. My timeline looked very similar in that I went to a lot of museum collections and I looked at a lot of different fossils of animals and used those specimens to try to figure out what 
features of these animals were interesting and important mm-hmm. for figuring out how these things evolved. But ultimately, that kind of data collection is something that is going to go on for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. One of the important parts of this whole dissertation process and the function of the committee is to say you have collected enough data to tell us something interesting. And then you have to kind of cut yourself off Mm -hmm. from collecting more data and kind of tell the story you have so far because you know you're going to keep working on this. That's the tough thing. Sometimes it's hard to tell when you're on the inside of your project. Sometimes you're like – Oh, man, I really – I need to go to that Nova Scotia museum and see that, that one animal. And your committee can rein you in and say, well, maybe you don't need to do that at this point. Or they can say, well, I think you need to definitely visit these specimens because you won't have addressed enough information if you don't. And I, that's a, uh, an insight that I only gained as I was doing this process. Definitely. Was, was yeah. that there comes a point where you have enough to answer the question you originally proposed – and you as, you, as you become an expert, you discover all of these other questions you want to answer, but those will become part of your future career as a paleontological researcher. Definitely. And maybe you won't answer them. Maybe you will pass them off to a student who's interested in the same things you are. So we got our PhDs. Supposedly. Like, I, I still don't really feel – that's another thing. Like on an emotional level, like at the end of it, you are writing and writing and writing writing and writing because you're trying to take all of this data that you collected over years and try to figure out and you need to not only figure out what it means but then you have to explain it to someone who hasn't been with you the whole way because your committee doesn't like follow you on these research trips or anything your advisor doesn't follow you on these research trips you need to distill that information into basically what amount to scientific papers chapters in a book your dissertation is a book with chapters that these people can take and read and understand from that reading whether you have completed sufficient work. And ideally they can see what your next questions will be. That not right. only have they are they going to anoint you essentially as a researcher who can ask and answer questions, but you also can then take the results that you attain from looking at material you see around you yeah. and then say what next? Because you have to be able to launch into the next question in order to tell us more about the fossil record or if you're a chemist or a physicist, how the the structure of the universe works. So now, what are you doing? Well, I am a postdoctoral fellow, what is traditionally called a postdoc. So what a postdoc is, is a research position that you are, you are, you are given. If you, you apply for it just like any other job and you are given this research position, if they think your qualifications are sufficient and your interests are comparable, I'm a postdoc at Yale University in the Department of Geology connected to a, to a museum they have there. And I'm doing research into the evolution of mussels in fossil reptiles because while I was doing my dissertation research – I'm studying all these new speci- all these specimens that hadn't been looked at in some time. I noticed that there's a whole bunch of anatomical data that no one had ever noticed on these specimens. Lots of like ridges and bumps and holes and all these things in the bones that suggest a lot about the evolution of muscles. But I wanted to build a better context for interpreting those. I want to see what the muscles look like in living reptiles. And that's the centerpiece of the work I'm doing at Yale right now. And your fellowship is actually supported by the National Science Foundation. National Science Foundation, that's right. um, Which is a group that helps fund these big research questions that we want to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, And in order to get that, you had to complete your PhD to demonstrate to the National Science Foundation that you would use that research money to ultimately answer a really interesting question about the evolution of reptiles. For me, I started working as a postdoctoral researcher at Ohio University. And there I got the opportunity to work on basically the next question, those questions that were sparked by my dissertation research about the evolution of this meat-eating group of mammals that finally goes extinct in Africa um, only about like between 15 and 7 million years ago. So like, they almost come up to kind of the origin of the earliest upright walking apes. But not quite. Not quite. They're not quite there. Um, but there's this really interesting time period where these African meat eaters are meeting 
these carnivorans, the early relatives of dogs and cats and bears. So the ancestors of lions and cheetahs and hyenas, the animals we see in Africa eating meat today. And so I really want to connect these evolutionary dots from this extinct group of animals to the early relatives of those lions and cheetahs to finally get into what our modern meat-eating niche looks like in Africa. And at Ohio University, there's a researcher named, named Nancy Stevens who works on this really interesting time period where we have all kinds of African animals encountering things coming from the north and the ecosystem is being turned over. There's massive climate changes going on. So in a lot of ways, this kind of goes from the questions posed by the doctorate dissertation process feeding into my next research question. So it's kind of a continuation of once I've demonstrated I can answer questions, go to the next question and answer that, just like you were working on. Yep. So stay tuned as we continue yeah. our research. The next step for, for both of us is, unfor I won't say unfortunately, oh, no, I'll say unfortunately, it's a little more writing because we have to take our papers from our dissertation and put those into the format necessary to get them as journal articles, to get them out not only to our dissertation committee and the university, but the, the world at large so they can see what we – well, they can meet us Well, they can, they can see what we worked on and then yeah. they can find their own opportunities, ask questions mm -hmm. that are sparked by the work that they we did. They can ask us questions. They can seek out collaborations with us. Fingers crossed. Or just create their own independent projects sparked by the yeah. kinds of questions and the research that we perform. Because that's science. how science works. Yeah, it only works by stand what is it, standing on the shoulders of giants. And Ooh, I'm literate. Listen to that. <laughs> yeah, how you doing? Is that good? I think that's you good. You feeling good? I think. So with that, we will continue reporting. Yeah, on, past time isn't going away. On what and we now that's discovered. Thank, <laughs> actually, I'm just going to say thank God he's back. Because... Yeah, you know, I've been telling stories on my own from my 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 home in New Haven, and it's been lonely. And now you know, I, I got to talk about Kerberos and all these all these crazy mammals, and I haven't had anyone to tell me, well, why they're crazy. And so now we'll both be able to tell more stories of the fossil record discovered by other people working on their PhDs, oh, yeah. by other researchers with their PhDs, and some, old, old fogies like us too, and some people who don't have their PhDs who are still research paleontologists. Oh yes. Yeah. So as we go forward, stay tuned for all the greatest new discoveries, for all the great new discoveries from very old bones. And with that, I'm Matt Bortz. Uh, it's Dr. Bortz. And I'm Adam Pritchard. Dr. Pritchard. Oh, thank you. And we'll see you next time on Pastime. Pastime.